Welcome to NFL Imperialism. You may have seen this concept floating around YouTube, but I wanted to put my own spin on it by going through every season in the Super Bowl era and hopefully improving upon it. If you're interested in a full thorough breakdown of how imperialism works, feel free to take a look at the first three or so minutes of our initial video of the 1966 season. That video is linked on its own in the description below. Right beneath that is a link to a playlist of all completed imperialism videos to date. Otherwise, we're ready to start. We wrap up another decade, but not the century or the millennium, with the 1999 season in what was a season of massive upheaval in the NFL. The powers of the 90s, the 49ers, Cowboys, and Packers all failed to post winning records. The Colts, Seahawks, Buccaneers, and Rams all won division titles for the first time in over 10 years, with the Bucks waiting 18 years. And for the first time since the merger, the league had an odd number of teams, creating the need for at least one team to be on by every week of the season. This was due to the resurrection of the Cleveland Browns franchise, as seen here on our new map, returning to split the state of Ohio with the Bengals. Although this was the official line, in every other way the Browns were an expansion team. The other change on this map is in the state of Tennessee, where the Oilers changed their name to the name that they retain to this day, the Titans. With that, the team's logo changed as well. It did them well, as in their first season as the Titans, they advanced to their first ever Super Bowl, where they played against and lost to the St. Louis Rams, a game famous for Mike Jones stopping Kevin Dyson one yard short of the goal line as time expired to preserve the Rams' victory, their first ever Super Bowl championship. The Rams were an amazing story themselves, posting a losing record every season of the 90s with double-digit losses in all but one, only to turn it around and go all the way to the top. And to the top they went, as they rank out as our number one team this season. Continuing the theme of upheaval, the entire top five is new from the previous season. The first time that's happened since 1980. And the 49ers, so great for so long, fall into the bottom five, which is unsurprisingly headed up by the expansion Browns. It's time to get it on. 1999 imperialism begins now. Our first spin of the wheel this season will give us the Jacksonville Jaguars. They're going to head to the Northwest into the territory of the Atlanta Falcons, our number two rated team will take the field in the first game. It's been a sluggish first half for the Jaguars, but they have the ball at the Atlanta 37. Time is ticking away in the first half, but Jimmy Smith will catch this pass and run it in for the touchdown. The first score of the game, giving the Jaguars a seven to nothing lead. This provided enough momentum for them going forward for them to take this game 28 to seven. The Jaguars failed to make the Super Bowl this year, but they are definitely a threat to win this imperialism. They will take over the territory of the Atlanta Falcons and we have our first elimination. The wheel will be sending the Detroit Lions west to face off with their division rival Packers in Green Bay. The Packers are looking to break the gridlock here in the second quarter. The pass rush is coming, but Favre gets the pass off. Tyrone Davis will make the catch, giving the Packers a 7-0 lead. That's actually going to be our halftime score. Here in the third quarter now, the Lions have gotten the ball down to the 12-yard line. The Packers move the defense up, but Greg Hill is able to run through and around it for the touchdown. That will tie things up at seven apiece. Greg Hill replacing the retired Barry Sanders this season. In the third quarter still, the Packers from the Detroit 18-yard line. They pick up the rush in the backfield. This touchdown pass goes to Antonio Freeman. Brett Favre will later add this touchdown pass to Bill Schrader. That's in the fourth quarter. 
the Packers have taken a substantial 21-7 lead, but don't tell the Lions that this one's over. They've driven it down inside the 10-yard line. Greg Hill up the middle will just break the plane of the goal line before getting taken down 21-14 now. There's still some time left in this game, but the Lions look like they want to onside kick this. It gets laid down, but Frank Winters recovers and gets a decent return out of it. The Packers, though, have fallen to third and 20 and are in a position where they need to throw. This pass is incomplete, so the Lions have a shot now. From their own 20-yard line, buck 45 to go in the game. Charlie Batch hangs in the pocket, gets rid of the ball to Johnny Morton, who gets about half the yardage that the Lions need to get into the end zone. It is now second down. The Packers call an audible on defense. The Lions do so on offense. Charlie Batch takes the snap. He's looking downfield. Jermaine Crowell runs under the ball, and he too will just break the plane of the goal line before getting stopped. That will tie things up at 21 apiece. There's still time for the Packers, though. Just 16 seconds. From their own 41, the pitch goes to Dorsey Levins. He's going to run it to about midfield, gets past midfield. With two seconds left, there's time for one last play. From just inside the 50, Bill Schrader is running by himself, but Favre's throw isn't very good. Schrader will make the catch, but get taken down. Had that been a better throw, he could have scored. Instead, this game is heading to overtime, tied at 21. The Lions get it first at their own 30-yard line. This handoff up the middle is going to go to Greg Hill. He is going to swerve his way through the defense and get a lot of yards here down to almost field goal range. Not quite, though, so they're going to run another play from their own 33-yard line. Why not go to Hill again? Cuts inside and will get inside the 10-yard line. What a huge game Greg Hill had today. Now Jason Hansen will come out for the 34-yard game-winning field goal. It is good. The Lions complete the 14-point fourth quarter comeback and win this game in overtime 24-21. Greg Hill's career-high rushing total in the NFL was 158 yards. He entered overtime with 136 before running for 60 yards, giving him 196 on the game. Incredible performance by him and by the Lions. They will take over the territory of the Green Bay Packers, and they are moving on. The Bears took the time to expand, but now they're traveling to Indianapolis to face the Colts, and the three states that all lay claim to Abraham Lincoln are up for grabs. This game started out on fire. The Bears have driven the ball straight down to the Colt 19-yard line. Play action, Shane Matthews is going to find Bobby Ingram, gets his feet down in the back of the end zone for the touchdown. The Bears travel to Indy and jump out to a 7-0 lead. Don't think the Colts aren't coming back, though. They've got second-year quarterback Peyton Manning leading the way from the 22-yard line. This short pass is going to go to Terrence Wilkins, but Wilkins will do the rest and score the touchdown. That will tie things up at seven apiece, and we still have time left in the first quarter. The Bears have gotten the ball down to the 22-yard line. This handoff goes to Curtis Enos, and he is going to power his way through the Colts' defense. Goodness gracious, he won't go down. This leads to a Bear field goal. It's 10-7. The Colts come right back. They've driven it down to the four-yard line of the Bears. Play action. The pass goes to Terrence Wilkins. That's his second touchdown of the game. And the Colts lead 14 to 10. But from here, the game got defensive. And we enter the fourth quarter with that same 14 to 10 score. The Colts drop back the pass. Peyton's holding the ball for way too long. Rico McDonald takes him down for the sack. That'll give the Bears the ball back. They're now at the 40-yard line. Hand off up the middle to Edgar Bennett. He's stuffed on third down. That's going to lead to the Bears going forward here on fourth down. They're going to need to pick this up. 
to give themselves a chance to win this game. Shane Matthews, he's going to look for Curtis Conway. It's knocked away, and the Colts run out the clock. And after this game started out so red hot, we went scoreless the rest of the way. The Colts will take it, though. They win 14-10. So the lands of Lincoln are going to belong to the Indianapolis Colts. They will take over the territory of the Chicago Bears, and they are looking like a strong team here in the Midwest. We come back to the wheel. It will land on the Philadelphia Eagles. They will head to the Southwest, but not south enough to avoid their in-state rival, the Pittsburgh Steelers. That's going to be our next game. Tight game in the third. The Steelers lead 10-6, but they're at the five-yard line. Cordell Stewart looks downfield, instead dumps it off to Jerome Bettis, and he'll run it in for the touchdown. The Steelers extend their lead to 17-6. They will give up a safety, but from there score 10 more points and take this game by a final of 27-8. The Eagles are in transition in 1999, but they're set for a good run coming up ahead. In the meantime, the Steelers will take over their territory, and they now own the entire state of Pennsylvania. We continue along here, and the Pittsburgh Steelers are being called right back up. This time they've got to travel, though. They're going northwest, hitting the territory of a top five team, the Buffalo Bills. In the third quarter, the Bills lead 10-0, looking for more. Doug Flutie's going to drop back the pass, throws it up for Eric Mould. He goes up and makes the catch, escapes the defenders, scores his second touchdown of the game. The Bills extend out to a 17-0 lead. They have no problem in this game whatsoever. They win 24-3. The Bills were indeed a top five team this season, victims of the Music City Miracle, but they win this game. They take over the Steelers' territory, and the states of New York and Pennsylvania are under their fold. We're going to be sticking in the Northeast here. The wheel selects the New York Jets. They're going to be heading to the Northwest, and like the Steelers before them, the Bills are being brought right back onto the field, hosting the Jets. In a surprise, the Jets lead this game 14-6 in the fourth quarter. Curtis Martin makes a great block in the backfield, allowing Ray Lucas to find tight end Fred Baxter. He runs it in the rest of the way. The Bills were desperately needing a stop there to get back into this game. They don't get it. And in a major upset, the Jets go into Buffalo and take out a top five team, 21 to six. The Jets had a big run to the AFC title game in 98, but they fell off this season. That didn't appear to be the case in this game, though. They will take over the territory of the Buffalo Bills, and the Jets are the major presence right now in the Northeast. No need to spin the arrow when it lands on the Dolphins. They're heading into Tampa Bay to face the Buccaneers. The Buccaneers are on the edge of the goal line here in the third quarter. This pitch goes out to Warwick Dunn. He's going to waltz into the end zone for the touchdown, extending the Buccaneer lead to 14-3. They used the fourth quarter to give kicker Martin Gramatica some practice. He made three of them in there, giving the Bucs a final score win of 23-3. 1999 was the final season for legendary Dolphins quarterback Dan Marino. He doesn't go out the way he wants to, but it was better than they did in the real 99 season. The Buccaneers will take over the Dolphins territory, and they are the team now in Southern Florida. 25 of 31 teams remain, and we're going to get the champs. The Rams are chosen. They're heading northeast, and that's going to give us an early marquee matchup. The Rams head to Indy to face the Colts in a matchup of two top five teams that both won 13 games in 1999. We're all tied up at seven apiece in the second quarter. The Rams have the ball at their own 44 play action. Warner goes deep to Torrey Holt, makes the catch by himself at the 30 yard line, runs it in the rest of the way for the touchdown. That will extend the Rams lead 
to 14-7. The Colts will pull back a field goal, and they have the ball now, trailing 14-10. They're at the edge of the goal line, and Edger and James will run it in for the score. The Colts have now jumped out to a 17-14 lead. But the Rams are going back to the well here from their own 47-yard line. Once again, Warner's going to throw deep to Torrey Holt. He makes the catch, but this time the Colts' defense is going to pursue and get him down at the 7-yard line. But on the very next play, this pitch goes out to Marshall Falk. He will get into the end zone, giving the Rams the lead once again at 21-17. The Rams have kicked the field goal. So they lead by seven, but the Colts are looking to tie things up. From their own 40-yard line, Edron James goes up the middle, breaks the tackle, and he's taking off. The Rams have a couple of guys pursuing, but they do a little Three Stooges routine, take each other out, and James runs it in the rest of the way for the touchdown. 60 yards to tie this game up at 24. Now the Rams are looking to take the lead back. They're on the Colt 30-yard line. Marshall Falk is going to do a double pirouette between the Colt defenders. It's an amazing run, getting it down to the two-yard line. That leads to this touchdown pass to Isaac Bruce. And the Rams will not go away. Their offense is amazing. They have taken a 31-24 lead. The Colts now face fourth down, fourth and long. From the Ram 47, Mike Jones comes off the edge to take Peyton Manning down. That's going to lead now to the very next play. The Rams have the ball. Kurt Warner looking deep once again for Isaac Bruce. Has a couple of steps on the defender. He will score the touchdown. That gives the Rams their biggest lead of the game here in the fourth quarter, 38-24. The Colts score very late to cut it down, but the Rams get out of here with the 38-30 victory. This matchup lived up to the hype. It was a heavyweight battle, but the Rams go into Indianapolis and win. They take over the Colts' territory, and they have established themselves as Super Bowl champion, number one rated team, and the favorite to win this imperialism. Our next wheel spin is going to take us out west. The Oakland Raiders have been chosen just barely. They're going to head to the southeast. Heading on to San Diego to take on the lowly Chargers. The Raiders had to settle for two field goals in the first quarter, but here in the second quarter, they're looking to get in the end zone. That's just what they do. Fullback John Ritchie takes it in from close range to give the Raiders a 13-0 lead. They didn't have to do very much the rest of the way to secure this victory. 20-7 is our final. This is kind of the last era of consistently good Raider football. They're going to look to take advantage in imperialism. They get off to a good start by taking over the territory of the San Diego Chargers and expanding their land. We're looking to get right back on the field and the wheel's going to cooperate. The Titans are chosen. They're going to head to the southeast. That's going to just clip in to the Jaguars territory. This sets up an interesting matchup. The Jaguars went 14-2 in 1999. Both of those losses came to the Titans. And then in the playoffs, they also lost to the Titans. Can they get their win back in imperialism? Tennessee leads 13-7 in the second quarter. The Jaguars change up their defense. The Titans will change up their offense. From the shotgun, Steve McNair takes a snap and takes off around left end, cuts it back inside. And he's able to get into the end zone for the touchdown run as time is set to expire in the first half. The Titans jump out to a 20-7 lead and they dominate the rest of the way, beating the Jaguars in Jacksonville 30-7. Sometimes one team just has another team's number. The Jaguars have played 20 games in 1999, counting the real world and imperialism. They won 16 of them, and they lost all four games they played against the Titans. Tennessee will take over Jacksonville's territory, and in an interesting note here, the Jags are the fourth team to win a game and then take the field for a second game and lose it. We've eliminated 10 teams this season. All 10 games have been won by 10 different teams.
After the Cowboys expanded into Oklahoma, the Chiefs decided they wanted to invade. Kansas City will head into Dallas. Here in the third quarter, the Chiefs have yet to score, but they're on the edge of the goal line. They trail 6-0. The pitch goes to Tony Richardson. He's able to get in. The Chiefs finally, with little time left in the third quarter, get on the board here. They lead 7-6. They have the ball once again deep in their own territory, looking to pick up a third and 18. This pass across the middle will go to Bam Morris. They'll make the catch. The sticks come out, but he's short. That leads to a punt, giving the Cowboys the ball at their own 34-yard line. Emmett Smith goes up the middle. He's going to drag a tackler, break another tackle, turns on to speed. He's going to drag another tackler, avoid another one, and there is still gas left in this tank. Emmett Smith, 66 yards for the touchdown. The Cowboys retake the lead, 13-7. The Chiefs embarking now on what would be a game-winning drive. Third and short pitch goes to Tony Richardson. He's got the first down, and he's going to get a bunch more. The Chiefs from here are able to take it down to the one-yard line. Should Richardson get the ball again here? No. Gerback will throw the comebacker to Derek Alexander. It works just the same. The Chiefs will kick this extra point and lead 14-3. Now Cowboys kick returner. Jason Tucker is going to try to give the Cowboys a spark. It's a short kick. Tucker is able to take it out past the 40-yard line, but he fumbles. The ball is loose, and the Chiefs will pick it up. That's going to secure them the victory. A one-point game in Dallas. Final score, 14-13. That was Derek Thomas forcing that fumble for the Chiefs, who unfortunately played his final season in 1999 after tragically passing away in the following offseason. The Chiefs win this game. They take over the states of Oklahoma and Texas, knocking the Cowboys out of the game. For the second time, the Raiders are going to be chosen on this wheel by the thinnest of margins. They're going to be sent to the Northwest, and it pains me to say this, to the lowly 49ers. Oakland leads 14-7 in the second quarter. From the 9 or 18 yard line, this play action pass goes to James Jett, and he's able to make the catch and coverage, extending the Raider lead to 21 to 7. They had a little problem going forward. They win this game handily, 34 to 13. And here in our 12th game of 1999 imperialism, the Raiders become the first team to win two games on the fifth time of asking. They take over the 49ers' territory, and the Raiders hold dominion over the state of California. We've got no time for expansion. We want to get back on the field. The Chiefs will take us there by heading west into the newly acquired territory of the Denver Broncos. The Broncos, two-time defending imperialism champions, have won 14 consecutive games. If they win this next one, they will tie the record. Let's see if they can do it. We're tied at 7 in the second quarter. The Broncos have it at the Chief 33. Brian Greasy goes downfield for Rod Smith. And this looks exactly like the touchdown Eric Mould scored earlier for the Bills. The Broncos take a 14-7 lead. They're going to take that lead into the second half where the Chiefs are looking to tie things up. From the Bronco 39, Elvis Gerback is steamrolled by Bill Romanowski. The Broncos are going to pick up the fumble. Glenn Cadrez breaks one tackle, breaks another, and he's able to just get into the end zone to continue the Bronco lead at 21 to 7. They're going to tack on a field goal. It's 24 7, but the Chiefs have driven the ball down inside the one yard line. This is Tony Richardson time. He gets in for the touchdown. We've seen crazier comebacks than this. Do the Chiefs have a chance here? They're going to go for two and miss. So it's 24 to 13, and they once again have the ball from the Bronco 21-yard line. Gerback looks downfield. Derek Alexander outmuscles the defender, and the Chiefs are making some noise here. The extra point will make a 24-20. If they can get this onside kick, they're going to have a great chance. 
they lay it down, and of all people for the Broncos, Brian Greasy recovers the kick. He eventually goes down, the Broncos tack on one more field goal, and get away from this game with a 27-20 to victory. There's a couple of things we need to unpack here. First things first, the Broncos win this game, take over the Chiefs' territory. The Broncos win this victory, tie the record set by the 71, 72, 73 Redskins of 15 consecutive Imperialism victories. Another point here, 13 games in, 17 games remaining, every top five team has already been eliminated except for our number one rated Super Bowl champion Rams. What might be in store for us next? The wheel selects the New England Patriots and they're able to find that little space in Massachusetts to get through and hit the territory of the New York Jets. Can the Jets become just the second team to win a second game? New England has it at the Jet 26, 14-7 lead into fourth. Drew Bledsoe out of the shotgun, throws across the middle to Terry Glenn who makes a stupendously amazing catch, diving between two guys, holding onto it, and staying in bounds. That catapults the Patriots to a final score win of 28-16. No, the Jets cannot become just the second team to win two games. The Patriots will take over their land and with that little tail of Massachusetts hanging behind them, they are now the presence in the Northeast. Here we go again, and in a rare occasion, the wheel will select the Patriots for a second time. They're going to head to the Southeast, where the New York Giants are just sitting right there. That's going to be our next game. The Giants lead 6-0 in the second quarter. They've kicked two field goals. Here on third down, they're going to try to avoid another one. The pass goes to Amani Toomer. He's not bothered by any of the defenders around him. That's a touchdown, making this 13-0. The Patriots have slept walked through this entire game. It's still 13-0 in the fourth quarter. Drew Bledsoe rolls out, avoids Michael Strahan, and drops a dime to Sean Jefferson. The Patriots finally have life. They've cut the lead down to 13 to 7. They have the ball again with 219 to go. Third and 11. Bledzo looks for Sean Jefferson again. It's knocked away. That means they're going to be going for it on fourth down. Just over two minutes to go. This pass is quite frankly not good. It goes out of bounds. Incomplete. The Giants are able to run out the clock and hold on for a 13-7 victory. In quite the amazing trend here, the Patriots now become the sixth team to attempt to win a second game, but failing to do so. The Giants will take over their territory, and we've played half the games we're going to play in this imperialism. 15 of them, 14 different teams have won a game. With this next wheel spin, we will be welcoming back the Cleveland Browns. They're going to head to the Northwest. They're going to be in Detroit to play the Lions. Let's see how the Browns do upon their return. They're hanging in there. It's 14-6 in the second quarter. This handoff is going to go to Corey Schlesinger, reliving his Nebraska days, gets into the end zone for the touchdown. The Browns have settled for field goals. The Lions have been putting it into the end zone. That will extend the lead to 21 to 6. The Browns made some noise in the second half. In the end, we get an odd final score victory for the Lions, 27-18. A valiant effort here by the Browns, but it just wasn't enough. The Lions win, they take over their territory and join the Raiders as the only two teams to win a second game now. This is a rough outcome for the Bengals, because even though they're going to get to be at home, they're having to welcome the Super Bowl champion Rams. And as expected, the Rams have done pretty much as they've pleased. From the Bengal 26, this play-action pass will go to Torrey Holt, goes up, makes the catch, 
giving the Rams yet another touchdown, extending their lead to 35 to six. By the time it was all said and done, they walk away with a 49 to 12 victory. The Rams won't be picking up a large piece of land, but they will be eliminating another team off the map. They do take over Southern Ohio and the Rams as the final top five team left again are the favorites. After a very short hiatus, we're heading back to the Northeast. The Ravens are chosen to head to the Northwest into the territory of the New York Giants. Because the Baltimore Ravens do not appear in Tecmo Super Bowl III, we've had to place them into the uniform of another team. In this case, that will be the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Ravens have taken the ball down the field in the first quarter. From inside the one-yard line, fullback Charles Evans plunges in for the touchdown to give the Ravens a 7-0 lead. We're now in the second quarter where the Giants are also inside the one-yard line. They're going to be throwing it though. Kent Graham will find a Monty Tumor near the back of the end zone, quickly tying this game up at seven apiece. We'll now move ahead to the third quarter where the Ravens hold a 10 to seven lead. They're at the giant 22 yard line. Tony Banks is gonna look for Kadri Ismail. Too many defenders there. Matt Stover will come out to lead the fourth quarter off with a field goal, giving the Ravens a 13 to seven lead. The Giants are gonna try to come back. They're facing fourth and 10 in their own territory. Ken Graham looks deep for Ike Hilliard, horribly overthrown. Knocked away by the Ravens, they're able to eat up the rest of this clock, and they come away with a 13-7 road victory. And with this victory, the Ravens will take over the Giants' territory, and because the Jaguars have been eliminated from this imperialism, the Ravens are just going to stay in their uniforms as long as they're still alive. The Lions have put together a good showing this season, but now they've got to go to St. Louis and play the Rams. Well, I accidentally put this game in Detroit, but it really didn't make any difference. The Rams already lead 24-0. This touchdown pass from Kurt Warner to Isaac Bruce is going to extend that lead in the third quarter to 31-0, and the Lions were pretty hapless in this one. They come away losers, the Rams win it 41-15. With all the parody that's been on display in this season's imperialism, it's the Rams, after a relatively close game against the top five team, who are dominating the field. They will take over the territory of the Detroit Lions and woe be on to any team that currently borders this powerhouse. With the Dolphins now out of the game, the Buccaneers become the team that don't need an arrow spin. There's only one place for them to go, and it's the territory of the Tennessee Titans. This should be a defensive battle. Well, it was on one side. The Titans have a commanding second quarter lead. This draw play to Eddie George. He's showing off some moves, gets into the end zone. That was a 22-0 lead prior. It is now a 29 to nothing lead. The Titans poured it on in this game, beating the Buccaneers 43 to six. This Buccaneer defense held the St. Louis Rams to just 11 points in the NFC title game. That kind of defensive performance was not seen here. The Titans will take over their land, taking over the rest of Florida. They are the team in the South right now. The Cardinals will head to Denver to face the Broncos. If the Broncos win this game, they will set the new imperialism record for most consecutive victories. We're tied at seven in the fourth quarter, but the Broncos are inside the five yard line. Fullback Howard Griffith 
is going to run this in for the touchdown. The Broncos defense is going to follow that up with a safety to give them a 16-7 lead. And they walk away with a final score, 23-7 victory. The Broncos win this game. They take over the land of the Arizona Cardinals, and they have done it. The 97, 98, 99 Broncos have won 16 consecutive games, setting a new imperialism record. Can they now perhaps set their sights on winning a third consecutive championship? Our next wheel spin will be bringing the Ravens back onto the field. Unfortunately for them though, they're heading into the territory of the St. Louis Rams. The Rams lead 14-0 in the second quarter. This handoff goes to Marshall Falk. He's stuck in a crowd, but he quickly escapes from it and turns on the Jets, taking it all the way to the house. 43-yard touchdown run to give the Rams a 21 to nothing lead. That touchdown was 43 yards. The Rams final point total was 42, while the defense pitched a shutout. 42 to nothing victory. At this point, it's pretty clear it's gonna take something special to knock the Rams off their perch. They will take over the territory of the Baltimore Ravens, and they are now the dominant team in both the Midwest and in the Northeast. With only nine teams remaining, the wheel will give us the Seattle Seahawks. The arrow's gonna head southwest, and from the center of their logo, they will travel into the territory of the Oakland Raiders. This AFC West matchup is next. The Raiders are holding a lead in the second quarter, 14 to seven. Rich Gannon drops back the pass. We'll find James Jett in the end zone for the touchdown. The Raiders extend out to a 21-7 lead. The ensuing kickoff will go to Amon Green, takes it at his own 19-yard line, uses his speed to get to the outside, picks up a block, has a chance to break it, but he's going to take it to the other 19, leads to a field goal. Now Seattle trails 21-10 in the third. They have it again. John Kitna looks towards Sean. Dawkins into the end zone for the touchdown. The Seahawks won the West in 99. They're not going away quietly. They cut it down to 21-17. They have the ball yet again. Their defense stepping up and getting it back. This pitch goes out to Ricky Waters. He's able to avoid all the defenders before finally going down at the 15-yard line. This will be quickly followed up by John Kitna finding Derek Mays in the end zone. The Seahawks have scored 17 unanswered points entering the fourth quarter. Now with a 24-21 lead, the Raiders though making a comeback from midfield. The Seahawks move the defense up. Rich Gannon will drop back the pass looking for James Jett again. Makes a diving catch at the 15-yard line. He finally goes down after a 35-yard gain. Gannon will roll out, again look for Jet, makes a diving catch in the end zone, spectacular, his second touchdown, giving the Raiders a 28-24 lead. The Seahawks now, back at their own 8-yard line, the Raiders crowd the line, so they run Waters around the end, and he's going to pick up a bunch of yards, dodging a tackle there. Breaking another tackle and getting it down to the 46 of the Raiders. But the Seahawks fall back to third and 16. On the play action, Kitna looks for Derek Mays. That's incomplete. And here now on fourth down, they're going to punt it. It's a long fourth down, so maybe the punt's the best idea here. The snap goes back to Jeff Fiedels. He gives it a good boot. Darian Gordon receives it inside the five yard line, picks up about 10 yards on the return. The Raiders have moved it up to the 38 yard line. Can they get one more first down? Gannon throws the jet. He makes another great play, gets it down inside the 25. The Raiders are gonna tack on a field goal and come away with this victory, 31-24. James Jett played his entire 10-year career with the Raiders in LA and in Oakland. His career high receiving yards was 148. In this game, he put up 212. The Raiders 
take over the land of the Seattle Seahawks, and they stand alone now on the West Coast. After quite a bit of expansion, the Minnesota Vikings are being drawn onto the field for the first time. But like so many others before them, they gotta go to St. Louis and face the Rams. It's late in the first quarter, the Rams already lead 7-0. Out of the shotgun, Kurt Warner hands it off to Marshall Falk. He gets past the first wave, and from here, his speed's gonna take him into the end zone. It's worth repeating, this Rams offense is lights out. They extend out to a 14 to nothing lead, and after scoring 28 points in the first half, they walk away with a final score victory of 42 to 14. The Rams continue to mow down the competition. They take over the Minnesota Vikings territory, and we have seven teams remaining. It may look like six, but the Washington Redskins still remain at their original starting point. Of these seven teams, three have yet to see the field. The Carolina Panthers can no longer say that. They will play host to the Tennessee Titans. The Titans find themselves trailing 14-0 in the third quarter. But here Steve McNair is going to find Yancey Thigpen in the end zone to cut that lead down to 14-7. Surprising that Carolina's defense would pitch the first half shutout. Here comes that offense though, it's third and goal from the nine. Steve Berline is going to look for Musin Muhammad streaking into the end zone, uses his size to make the catch, re-establishing a 14 point lead for the Panthers, 21 to 7. The Titans, now in the fourth quarter, need to respond, they've taken it to the Panther 15 yard line. Steve McNair fires to the back of the end zone, Kevin Dyson will come down with it. That'll cut this to a one-score lead. The Titans missed the two-point conversion, but it's 21 to 13. The defense needs to step up, but Carolina's taking it to the seven-yard line. Play action. Steve Burline looks across to the other side of the field and finds Patrick Jeffers. That is Burline's fourth touchdown pass of the game to four different players, and the Carolina Panthers are able to handle the Tennessee Titans with a 28-13 victory. The Titans had had a great run in this imperialism, but they ran into the Panthers in this one and couldn't take care of business. Carolina will take over Tennessee's territory, and they were only okay in 1999, but their offense is very good. After being avoided this entire time, the wheel will select the Washington Redskins. They could expand to Virginia, but instead, they're going to be the next team to try to go into St. Louis and knock off the Rams. The teams exchange quick touchdowns to start the game, and now the Redskins are down at the one-yard line. Larry Centers will go up the middle to score again. That's going to give Washington a 14-7 lead. Well, maybe not. Brett Conway's extra point gets blocked. Strike that, 13-7. The Rams now have it just inside the 50-yard line. They bring the house and take Kurt Warner down for the sack. That's Derek Smith, but maybe more importantly, oh no, Kurt Warner has been knocked out of this game. As is expected, this drive stalled and the Redskins got it back. From their own 35-yard line, Fake up the middle, pitch goes to Steven Davis. He is going to break a tackle, and he's going to jut down the sideline, pick up 32 yards and a first down. They have now fallen back to third and 18. They're going to run the same play, see if Davis can get him back in the field goal range. He does, and then some, picking up a first down and a lot more down inside the 10-yard line. Washington has to settle for a very short field goal here. 19 yards from Conway. He faces some pressure and he misses. Washington's kicking game is being a problem in this game. 
Kurt Warner replacement Paul Justin is going to chuck this ball deep to Torrey Holt. What a throw! And that's a touchdown. Maybe Justin can provide enough for the Rams to win this game. They take a 14-13 lead. They have the ball again. We are now in the third quarter. Justin drops back the pass, and this is going to be his downside. This ball is intercepted by Sam Shade. He's able to get a little bit of yardage on the return, but Justin needs to not be turning the ball over. Washington has it now from their own 33-yard line. Steven Davis is going to go off tackle, cuts back inside, untouched gets away he's being pursued by many players he breaks that tackle extends beyond the dime Stephen Davis is a one-man wrecking crew for the Redskins 67 yards on that run giving them a 20 to 14 lead the Rams have it again third and 13 when all else fails give this ball to Marshall Falk he gets around the end turns on the Jets they're able to catch up to him but he powers his way into the end zone the Rams will kick the extra point and maintain their one point advantage they have it again at the 38 yard line of Washington minute 29 to go trying to put it away Marshall Falk will run it just short of the marker and the Rams are going forward here they get this they're gonna get away with this victory what do they have in store here? It's a pitch to Marshall Falk, reverse to Torrey Holt, and he's eaten up for a loss. So Washington has a chance now. First play after the turnover on downs. Brad Johnson looks deep to Albert Connell. What a way to start this drive. But it stalls right here. It's third and eight, 33 seconds to go. Simple handoff up the middle. They're just trying to set up for the field goal. Brett Conway has missed the short one and had an extra point block. Can he pull it off here when it really matters? A 44-yard attempt, lines up, kicks it quickly, and this ball is true. The Redskins go into St. Louis and pull off a massive upset, winning this game 23-21. It's games like these that make doing these imperialisms so great for me. The Redskins weren't a nothing team. They were division champions and only lost in the divisional round by one point, which would have sent them to St. Louis for the NFC title game. All that said, they escaped their little enclave. They take over the territory of the Rams, and we're down now to our final five teams, and none of those five are in our top five. As a matter of fact, the Redskins are the only team remaining that had a winning record in 1999. We're about to get down to our final four. The Raiders are chosen on the wheel. They're going to head south, and that's actually going to take them into the territory of the Denver Broncos. The winner of this game will be our final team from the AFC left standing. The Raiders have controlled this game but only find themselves leading by six in the fourth quarter. John Ritchie takes care of that business though, plunging in from one yard out. He's been such a weapon in this imperialism. It's 23-10 Oakland. Denver is on the comeback trail. 2.19 to go. From the 41, Brian Greasy faces the pressure, gets the ball out to Rod Smith, and they somehow track him down inside the five yard line. The Broncos are now faced with a fourth and goal from the seven. Greasy. Feeling the pressure that isn't there, gets off a bad pass to Anthony Lynn, and the Raiders will take this victory, ending the Broncos' historic imperialism winning streak with a final score of 23-10. And the Raiders will indeed be 1999's final team from the AFC. They will take over the Broncos' territory, and we've got three pretty solid teams remaining, and then the Saints are just sitting there hoping to make it to the end without having to play. So much for the Saints running and hiding until the end. They now have to take the field at Carolina against the Panthers. After a scoreless first half, Carolina is on the move in the third quarter. 
Steve Berline's going to look for Patrick Jeffers in the end zone. He'll make the catch to break this gridlock. The Panthers have jumped ahead to a 7 to nothing lead. We're now going to go to the fourth quarter. Same score, the Panthers, third and eight. Carolina's going to throw for the first down. William Floyd will make this catch, come up short, and from the 33-yard line, they're going to punt. That's either a lot of faith in their defense or knowing that the Saints don't have much of an offense. This punt is going to go for a touchback. New Orleans takes over at the 20. They've actually moved it to the 36, but it's third and 11. Billy Joe Tolliver will throw incomplete to Eddie Kennison. So the Panthers get it back. They're going to try to grind down this clock and win this game 7 to nothing. But Rob Kelly has other ideas, forces the fumble of William Floyd, and Brady Smith's going to run it back in. So if the Saints' offense can't score, the defense will score for them. They will tie this game up late at 7 apiece, and we're going to be headed to overtime at 7-7. Seven to seven. The Saints get the ball first, but they're already facing 3rd and 11 inside the 10-yard line. Tolliver's pass to Aaron Craver falls incomplete. So the Panthers will get the ball on this punt. Eric Metcalf fields it at his own 42-yard line. This is a great return, 27 yards. But the Panthers fall out of field goal range, 3rd and 16. The Saints bring everybody up to the line the Panthers will throw this is going to go to Patrick Jeffers he's made two catches in this game we've seen them both the touchdown and this play to get him in field goal range John Casey coming out for the 29 yarder it's close but it's good and the Panthers struggle at home against a bad Saints team but they win in overtime 10 to 7 the Panthers really should have taken care of business a little easier than that, but at the end of the day, they picked up the win. They will take over the Saints' territory, and we're down to three teams, and by the nature of this map, any of these three teams can be in our next game. And we'll waste no time determining this game. The Redskins will head to the Southwest. Had they gone straight south, they would have hit the Panthers' territory. But by dipping to the west, they will instead have to fly across the country and play the Raiders in Oakland. The winner of that game will face the Carolina Panthers in the Imperialism Championship game. In the second quarter, the Redskins lead 3-0, facing a third down. Brad Johnson finds Albert Connell, beats the defense, gets into the end zone. A very important score for Washington there, giving them a 10-0 lead. The Raiders are fighting back, trying to get something before the half. From the 24, this is a fake reverse. Tyrone Waitley will keep it, and the fake worked. He gets into the end zone. The Raiders have life. It is 10 to 7, but there's still time left in this first half, and the Redskins will try to take advantage of that. From the 32 yard line, Steven Davis goes up the middle. He's stopped, but he gets away, and you need more than one guy to get this wrecking ball down. He takes it to the house, re establishing the 10 point lead, 17 to 7 at the half. We now go to the third quarter. The Raiders are at the Redskins 22 yard line. Tyrone Wheely will get the handoff. He'll break a tackle, trying to look like Steven Davis out there. Gets into the end zone for the second time. The extra point here is actually going to be blocked. So the score is going to stay 17-13. The Redskins inside the 40-yard line. We're still in the third. The pitch goes to Steven Davis. It might take the entire Raider defense to get him down, but they do get him down, leading to a Washington field goal. 20-13, the Raiders have a chance to tie it. We're still in the third. Rich Gannon's going to fire it to John Ritchie. That's a nice play by the fullback downfield down to the 15-yard line. Switching sides in the fourth quarter, it's third and 11. They're going to go to Richie up the middle. He picks up a few yards. That will set up a more manageable fourth down. It's not fourth and goal. They can get a first down here at about the five-yard line. The Redskins will 
back up the defense. That leads to this handoff by Tyrone Wheatley. Cuts it inside and just gets in for his third touchdown. The extra point works this time. This game is tied at 20 apiece. Washington will now try to embark on a game-winning drive. From inside their own 45-yard line, this deep pass will go to Michael Westbrook. He'll get it down to the 15-yard line. Redskins are in good position here. They've fallen back to third and 18. A quick throw to tight end Steven Alexander. Doesn't get the first down, so Brett Conway hits his third field goal barely. 23-20. Oakland has a chance now to take this game. It's third and 10 from their own 39-yard line. Rich Gannon throws to John Ritchie, catches it, but he's short. So once again, it's going to be fourth down. They went to Tyrone Wheatley last time. Will they do it again? The Redskins seem to anticipate this run. It's going to go to Ritchie instead. And they went to the well too many times. He stopped short. They're going to kick a fourth field goal in this game. And the Redskins will come away with the 26-20 final score victory. If the Raiders had won that game, we would have had a matchup of two 8-8 eight eight teams in the title game. Instead, the Redskins will go in with a winning record and play the Panthers. The Panthers seek to be the second team to ever win imperialism without a winning record during the regular season. The Redskins are looking to pull their own shocker, winning imperialism for a fourth time without a loss. An unexpected title game is on tilt. Let's see where the game's going to be played. The wheel is going to be landing on the Redskins, making them the attacking team. So the Carolina Panthers appearing in their first ever imperialism title game in just their fifth season of existence will get to host. Let's see who will win 1999 Imperialism. The Redskins will look to strike first in this game from just inside the 40-yard line. Brad Johnson looks downfield for Michael Westbrook. And it's incomplete. It's fourth down. It's kind of no man's land. They're going to try a field goal here. Brett Conway from 58 yards out. This would be an Imperialism title game record. He puts it up. It's got... Just enough leg and it's good. What an exciting way to make this a three to nothing game. The Redskins get it back. They're pinned deep in their own territory. Johnson looks for all reliable here. Albert Connell, he'll make the catch, fighting for extra yards. But Michael Swift of the Panthers is gonna force this fumble. The Panthers recover and take it down to the 20 yard line. What a turnaround. Second and 11, the passing game, trying to get into gear here. Burline looks for Masin Muhammad, makes a great diving catch. They're now facing third and goal. Two very short runs, don't get it in. Fake up the middle, the pitch to Tim. Bianca Batuka gets into the end zone. Carolina leads 7-3. to three. They need their defense to come to life again. But Washington's driven it down to the sixth, third and goal. They won't run Steven Davis. Instead, this pass is incomplete. Brett Conway, yet another field goal. Six in the last two games, it's seven to six. Carolina's gotten past midfield. We're at the two minute warning. Play action, Burline likes to go to Patrick Jeffers here. He does to great success. Gets it down to just about the five yard line. It's third down though, but the Panthers are smelling the end zone. Burline will drop back, find Musin Muhammad for the touchdown. Both teams have scored twice. The Redskins field goals, the Panthers touchdowns. It's 14 to six as we now enter the second half. Washington from their own 35 yard line. Johnson looking to throw, Michael Westbrook makes the catch, and bad tackling by the Panthers allows him to pick up a lot more after the catch, 55 yards. Next play, it's first and goal, just inside the 10. Johnson's gonna look again for Westbrook, and he did it all on this drive. It's early enough in the game that the Redskins kick the extra point. It's 14 to 13, the defense forces a three and out. They've driven it down to the 27. Steven Davis needs two yards here, and he 
fights to pick up three. That is very important, keeping this drive alive. They've pushed it now to the five-yard line. The handoff up the middle. Nope, a fake and pitch to Steven Davis. Hurdles his way into the end zone. And for the first time since it was 3-0, the Redskins have the lead. 20-14. Carolina will not rest in the dying embers of the third quarter. The pitch goes to Tim Bianca Batuka. He is going to get in the field goal range and pick up a first down. Carolina, of course, is not thinking about a field goal. They want to score, but it's once again third down. Burline's going to drop back, but he's going to get taken down back at the 32-yard line. It's going to be fourth down. Like we said, they are not thinking about a field goal. Fourth and 18. This is a huge ask of the Panthers' offense. You know they want to go to Musin Muhammad. They do. it will make the diving catch for the first down and almost breaks it in for the touchdown. They're set up real nice though. Play action up the middle, dump it off to Tim Biakabatuka. Makes the touchdown catch, scoring his second touchdown of the game. And the Panthers now lead 21 to 20. Now Brian Mitchell's been hurting them on kick returns all day. So they kick it short to him, try to mitigate his damage. But Mitchell has other ideas. He gets out past midfield. They're in pursuit. They grab a hold. He gets away. He pushes through another tackle. And he's able to get it in for the touchdown. The first ever kickoff return touchdown in an Imperialism title game. It's 27-21. The Panthers offense right back on the field trying to make this happen. Burline's going to look for Muhammad. He'll make the catch and run it to the 45. He might have to do all the work on this drive. It's third and 11. They keep falling in these situations. Muhammad stops short, will make the catch, but pick up a lot of yardage. He is having a monster game, over 175 receiving yards. It's second down, one minute, 37 seconds to go. Burline will try Muhammad again, and for the first time in this game, they don't connect. It is third down. Burline is gonna give it to Floyd up the middle. Short pickup, it's fourth and seven. They're gonna try to go to Muhammad, I will imagine. Instead, they run it to William Floyd. What a terrible play call. He's short. The Redskins take over. Chance to put it away. Steven Davis will get the first down, and that's gonna do it. Washington in a thriller. Win this game 27 to 21. It's an amazing thing. The Washington Redskins, under the ownership of Dan Snyder, were mostly an NFL laughingstock. But here in Imperialism, under Snyder's first year of ownership, they win the title. And this is their fourth title, and they've done so without losing in the championship game. With all the upheaval and downright wackiness of the 1999 NFL season, Imperialism seemed to hold the promise that the Rams would continue the three season long streak of the Super Bowl champion also prevailing in Imperialism. It wasn't meant to be. Instead, it was the team that defeated them, the Washington Redskins, who took the crown in Carolina over the Panthers, now tying them with the 49ers and Vikings for most Imperialism titles at four-piece. This is the roster they did it with. Their offense was stocked with threats all over the field, but without question, it was Steven Davis running behind this offensive line full of criminally underrated talents, such as Corey Raymer and John Jansen, who was the workhorse. Their defense once again features the ageless wonder, Daryl Green, playing in his 17th season, a remarkable feat for a cornerback. But his partner in crime at the other corner position, rookie Champ Bailey, set the tone for the Redskins defense and became a future Hall of Famer himself. The interior of the D-line, free agent acquisitions Dana Stubblefield and Dan Wilkinson, led the way in the front seven, opening up opportunities for their linebackers to get into the backfield on several occasions. As the NFL sees increases in scoring, so too does imperialism. Defenses weren't completely irrelevant though, with the Buccaneers and Titans 
putting on excellent displays in the first half of games. In the second half, the Titans kept that up, especially against the Bucks, but fell to the Panthers on their way to the title game. The Rams kept on winning until they didn't, dropping their matchup to the Redskins on their way to the title game, which they won in a barn burner over Carolina. The St. Louis Rams didn't win the Imperialism title, but they did lead the way with five victories, with the Oakland Raiders, the other team formerly of Los Angeles, notching four of their own. Over half the league's teams, 17 in fact, won at least one game, with an astonishing 10 of them going exactly one and one. By virtue of their championship game win, Washington sits atop the standings with their unblemished three victories. The overall standings see the same three teams, the Vikings, 49ers, and Cowboys, dominating at the top, but neither of them got a win this season. The Rams power into fourth place overall and are within striking distance of 50 overall wins. The Raiders, despite two imperialism titles, have just now gotten to 500, while 14 different teams now maintain a winning record. Thank you so much for watching this video and making it all the way to the end. A lot of excitement in this one. We'll be closing out the 20th century and the second millennium in our next video when we do the year 2000. In the meantime, please give this video a like, share it with some friends, and if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. For the fourth time, we hail to the Redskins, winners of 1999 imperialism as they lord over the map of the United States. It was quite the ride for them. Thank you again so very much for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day.